All right, we'll begin. I think we're live. All right, well, friends, welcome so much to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Jeff Hunt. I have the wonderful privilege of serving as the Vice President of Public Policy for Colorado Christian University, where I help direct our think tank, the Centennial Institute. Today's webinar is about the biology of COVID-19. Now, we've been hosting a lot of these webinars over the past few weeks. We've talked with teachers about how they're adjusting to this pandemic what our nurses, CCU nurses, are facing on the front lines of this pandemic, the legal implications, not only for us, but for churches as a result of the stay-at-home orders. So we've had all these events online. You can see them at our YouTube channel. Make sure you check them out there. Uh, and I do want to encourage you today on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, wherever you're watching this, uh, ask questions in the comment box, and we'll do our best to go through those and help you uh, answer some of your questions. But today's a webinar is so important on the biology of COVID-19, and we have some tremendous experts with us. We'll explore questions on the history of coronavirus, how it spreads, its impact on the body, the current responses, and most importantly, how science can defeat it. And as I mentioned, uh, I'm just so very proud of the expertise we have at Colorado Christian University. These are folks that daily I get to surround myself with. They're the best and brightest that we have in this nation. And uh, we're gonna hear from two of them today on the biology of COVID-19. First, we're gonna hear from Dr. Mark Parker. Dr. Parker trained as a developmental biologist and neuroscientist in preparation for working in academic research, where he studied the development of vertebrate nervous systems. From there, he transitioned into the biotech industry, where he served as the director of a technical service department, oversaw both internal production and external production, and directed a research and development team. He has always had a passion for teaching and was blessed to join the CCU faculty in 2011 as an associate professor of biology. Most recently, Dr. Parker has been an integral part of revamping the curriculum and increasing the enrollment in CCU's science program, developing the new industrial and systems engineering program, and launching the newly formed School of Science and Engineering on top of all that, his wife has been on the front lines of dealing with this as a cardiovascular registered nurse pursuing her nurse practitioner degree. Together, they have three sons. One of the cool things I love about Dr. Parker is he's a, he's a wild, adventurous guy, and maybe we'll get some of those stories of trips down to Baja, Mexico on his motorcycle, but uh, great to have Dr. Parker with us. We're also going to hear from Dr. Damon Perez. Dr. Damon Perez is an associate professor of biology in CCU's College of Adult Graduate Studies. He is the director of biological sciences and oversees all biology courses in the School of Nursing and Health Professions. Dr. Perez currently teaches both environmental science and human genetics and gen genomics, I believe I got that right, online to predominantly prospective nursing students. Past employers have included Applied Biosystems, and Life Technologies, a biotechnology company, and Mayo Clinic, where Dr. Perez has accumulated over 10 years of research, experience in molecular toxicology, advanced genomics, and uh, cancer research fields. Dr. Perez also has both online and in-seat teaching experience at a variety of colleges and universities. As you can see, we have a tremendous amount of experts with us today. We're so grateful to have them. Uh, and maybe Dr. Parker, I'll start with you. You've kind of put together a bit of a PowerPoint presentation for us uh, and walk us through a little bit about uh, COVID-19. Thank you, Jeff, for that kind introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen and just run you through some brief items here. And Dr. Perez, feel free to jump in at any time. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some things we can also add later. Uh, Jeff, it says my host has disabled participant screen sharing. So maybe you do need to run the slides for me. I will, uh, uh, I will make you a co-host and maybe that'll change it. You want to try again or I can share it over oh, here. Here we go. Okay. Uh, the joys of live streaming, right? <laughs> okay. Bear with me one moment here. Okay, so can you see a title slide? Looks great, coming through okay. loud and clear. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about what the virus actually is. And then in the background of the slide, you can see an artist's rendition of about what the viral particle would look like. So uh, these viruses are actually quite simple. And a virus, let's start there. A virus is a non-living infectious particle. So the average human cell is about 10 micrometers in diameter. So that's uh, a micrometer is one thousand of a millimeter. So if you think the smallest tick on your little ruler, that millimeter, it would take a hundred uh, human cells to reach across that one millimeter piece. Okay, and a viral particle is about an, a, a thousand times smaller than that. So we're talking extraordinarily small particles that consist of an outer envelope, which is what you can see in the background. And then on the inside, there's going to be a genome, the actual genetic material that codes for the proteins that compose the virus. When we're talking about COVID-19, we're talking about coronaviruses. And so with coronaviruses, they're going to have an RNA genome. So you and I's genetic information is coded for by DNA, which is then copied into RNA that acts as a message to carry the information from the genome to the rest of the cell where it can do its job. Coronaviruses sort of skip that step. Remember I said they're non-living particles. They can't do any of the uh, business of life on their own. Rather, they have to get themselves to the inside of a living cell, typically of a mammal with coronaviruses, and then their RNA becomes like one of the little messages that our body uses to tell the cell, to make more virus proteins. In the coronavirus genome, uh, there are very few genes. It's, ex it's extraordinarily simple. Coronaviruses are not new, not unique. There's at least seven identified coronaviruses causing human disease, uh, several of which cause mild upper respiratory things you can think of as a mild cold. About 10 years ago, we had a very important one called SARS. A few years after that, there was one called MERS. So these coronaviruses were ones that caused significant human disease. So SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, is the sort of precursor of COVID-19. People got sicker and died at a higher rate, but it was much less transmissible person to person than the current COVID-19. MERS arose in the Middle East. It was a Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, also a coronavirus, and also quite severe, but not very transmissible. So the big difference with the current outbreak is that this coronavirus is severe, but also transmissible. So let's talk about the makeup of the virus for just a minute. I said that it's a coat with genomic information on the inside. And so when you look at the structure of a coronavirus, you can see here in this figure, that you have this outer portion with these spikes sticking out that are labeled S. You have proteins uh, called envelope proteins, and then you have these matrix proteins in here. So these three proteins make up the outer surface of the virus itself. They're what's responsible for protecting it and allowing it to move in the environment and to get into living cells. So this S protein, the spike protein, is the root of infection. So this protein interacts with a protein on the surface of your own cells called ACE2. And it's that interaction that allows the virus to actually get into your cells. That spike protein interacts with the ACE2. And then there's a cleavage interaction that occurs that actually allows the internalization. So it's going to be these proteins that allow for survival and infection. Once the virus is into a cell, then it takes over using its internal components. So here inside, you see these squiggly little lines. That's the actual genome, the genetic information in this RNA genome. There's only about 30,000 bases, which is tiny compared to a human genome. And it's estimated that there's about 10 proteins coded for by this virus, including these coat proteins and what's called a nucleocapsid protein, which helps sort of protect and support 
the RNA genome itself. So in the uh, realm of biology, this is an extraordinarily simple package, right? It's got just enough information to get into a cell, to make more copies of itself so that it can move on to the next host. Um, where did SARS, or I'm sorry, where did COVID-19 come from? So it originally has been called SARS-CoV-2 because it was a severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. And unlike the original SARS, it was a different virus. So they called it SARS-B2. Um, the leading theories are that this was what's called a zoonotic transmission. So it moved from animals to humans. Now this is not unique or uncommon. So periodically we'll hear about things like bird flu or swine flu. Influenzas are able to fairly readily move from species to species. And when we look at that genome that we looked at a minute ago, when you read all the bases here, what you can see is that this virus is very, very similar to viruses that are found in both bats and pangolins. And so when we look at the origins of this virus, it appears to be one of these zoonotic transmissions where it was readily moved from one species to another. Now there's all sorts of other theories out there, but if you look at the science of the gene sequencing, it doesn't appear that there's been any manipulation of this genome, that it appears to be a direct transmission from another animal, possibly from a bat originally, and then through pangolins to humans or vice versa. We're still a little unsure of the details and they're working those things out. So in essence, what we're talking about is a tiny little particle that can float through the air in droplets, remain on surfaces for a few hours and then get picked up, utilizing the spikes on its surface to get into your cells. And from there using its internal genome to just make a bunch more copies of itself. So that's sort of a brief overview of the biology of the virus. Dr. Perez, do you have anything that you wanna throw in? Um, if you could go to the, your slide where you looked at the bats and the uh, pangolins. Um, yeah, so yeah, like, like you said, um, we're not sure exactly where that virus um, the origin of the virus, the reservoir host, bats, like you said, is um, notorious for being a reservoir for coronaviruses uh, in particular. And, uh, and some have suggested that there is a, what they call a chimera going on. Genomic comparison studies show that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a result of a recombination between two different viruses, one from the bat and one from the pangolin. Um, but um, still more studies need to be, be uh, carried out to, to verify that, but that's what I've come across. Uh, real quick question from those of us that aren't biologists or haven't taken a biology class in a while, what's a pangolin? <laughs> well, it, uh, from the articles I've seen, I, I wasn't very familiar with it either, but uh, uh, it, it looks like an armadillo. It, it has like scales. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think it's related to an armadillo, but um, I don't know. Mark, do you have any more information? That's all I have on that. <laughs> I, I'm going to be embarrassed if I'm wrong about this, but I believe it's a, it's more like an anteater, huh. but it does, yeah. it, but it is more scaled like an armadillo, but I believe it's most closely related to anteaters. Wow. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, this is what you get for asking molecular biologists and cellular biologists like <laughs> ecological organismal biology questions, I guess. Now, but, can people, uh, there's been rumors out there on the internet that this came from people eating bats. Is that one way they could get it or is it, is it transmissible through uh, maybe the stool of a bat or pangolin? Most likely, uh, so it looks like we shed virus in various ways. And, and there are anecdotal reports that virus can be shed in stool, for instance. Uh, most of it appears to be respiratory transmission though, because it's an upper respiratory infection. You tend to produce more mucus, you tend to expel more mu mucus, you cough, you sneeze. And so you can get what's called fomites, 
uh, which is where you have infectious particles on a surface and then that surface is exchanged, for instance. So in one of these wet markets, someplace like that, where you're going to have lots of animals co-localized, uh, you know, you've got mucus and that sort of thing, somebody touches it. And then the easy transmission is from your hand through your eye, your nose. Eating uh, typically is a pretty safe route because once you swallow something, you do drop it into this big vat of acid and digestive enzymes called your stomach, and it would destroy most viruses. So it's very unlikely that uh, ingestion is the route of transmission. Uh, the protein that I mentioned that this uses to infect your cells is very highly exp expressed in the uh, lining of the nose, for instance. So you wipe your eye, there's a little duct in the corner that drains from your eye into your nose. So your teardrop ducts continuously moisten your eye and then drop that down into your nose. And so touching your eyes, touching your nose, that sort of thing, most likely route of transmission. Somebody touched a surface or handled a bat or pangolin or whatever that had it, then touched their face. Gotcha. We are getting some good questions. Would you like me to jump in with some of these questions, Dr. Parker, Dr. Perez? Yeah, that'd be fine. Great. Uh, from the illustrious first lady of Colorado Christian University, Christina Sweeting, she asked, uh, what about published papers by uh, Dr. Zengli, who apparently did some recombination splicing of HIV GP41 into COVID-19? Any comment on that? I have not seen that uh, paper, unfortunately, but I will look for it. Dr. Yeah, I've, I've heard of something like that, but I, I, I'm just not knowledgeable about that whole treatment option. So I, I, I couldn't really respond to that. <laughs> I apologize. Gotcha. No worries, as you can see, we have Great thinkers throughout the university asking good questions. Um, could some medication uh, be used to harden the outer shell and prevent the genome from getting out? Getting out of the virus, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, there, there are various treatments obviously to, brought, to block the pathway of the actual virus binding to the cell, but uh, the ACE2 receptor, um, but actually blocking the DNA uh, entering the cell. I'm not sure that this, the DNA is, enters the cell through the cytoplasm, which is different than influenza. Influenza goes all the way to the nucleus and, and does its, its thing. Um, but the ACE2 receptor is, is very uh, unique in what's called the angiosteen, um, angiotensin um, system, where ACE and ACE2 receptors are key modulators that regulate blood pressure, inflammation, and body fluid homeostasis. So um, uh, most phar pharmaceuticals would probably block either that interaction or some kind of inhibitor or actually to kind of block some of the uh, molecules that are actually uh, participate in, in the uh, virus that actually binds to the, uh, the ACE2 receptor. The only way I can think of that working as a uh, treatment is there is a protease step that occurs. So there's, there's actually a cleavage once the spike protein has bound to the ACE2. I don't know if we're aware yet exactly what proteases are involved, whether it's the viral protease itself or whether it's an endogenous human protease. The protease that allows that cleavage infusion to occur might be a target, and that would be a way potentially to keep the RNA in the viral shell rather than uh, allowing its movement to the cytoplasm. All right, y'all are <laughs> y'all are talking very good stuff. Uh, uh, I, I have a slide if I could share it. I don't know if I have the yeah. privileges to share, but 
um, sure. that could maybe explain some of the the ways that we could go about trying to tackling this. Um, let's see if I can share this real quick. You're looking good. Okay, good. Let me put it in slideshow mode here. So um, let's see here. So the virus here is the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And it has these spikes. That's why they call it kind of has like a crown or surrounding it. Um, and this is a very complicated figure, so don't get intimidated by this. I just want to show a few things. Um, the spike here, actually, um, this, this protease right here actually helps it prime so it can bind to the ACE2 receptor that's found on the cells. And like I said before, ACE2 and ACE1 actually uh, provide a very delicate balance between uh, tissue injury and tissue protection. Um, so what we can do is we could take a spike vaccine that actually, that, that will kind of block that. Uh, the ACE2 receptor blocker, we can have a molecule that will block the ACE2 receptor so the virus will not bind to that receptor. Um, we could take a soluble ACE2, something that uh, has that component that is similar or the same, hopefully, to the ACE2 receptor that will kind of accompany or kind of occupy all of the spike proteins or, that are or surround the virus and kind of um, kind of suffocate the virus where it'll hold that in place so it's not able to bind to the receptor. Um, or we can do, we can uh, have a, um, some kind of molecule that will inhibit this protease, which helps bind the virus to that ACE2 receptor as well. So these are some molecular, molecular ways where we can kind of look at to see how this will actually, um, how we can stop the virus from actually binding to where it needs to bind or where it wants to bind on the cell. And where are we in the process of these? You talk about the spike vaccine, uh, ACE2 receptor blockers. Now it takes a while for these to be developed, is that correct? Oh, oh yes, yes. Um, a vaccine typically takes several years to develop, um, and they're talking this this one where they're, they're talking maybe um, a year or two, which is which would be record breaking. Um, <clears throat> but we have kind of a head start because the SARS one virus uh, that that happened almost twenty years ago. Um, there have been researchers that have started to develop a vaccine for that virus. And so, but unfortunately, funding and interest kind of ran out because that virus kind of just went away. So um, now they're looking at kind of revamping that research. And that kind of gives us a head start because the SARS-1 and the SARS-2, the COVID-19 virus, are very similar in a lot of different ways, their, their DNA is about 75% similar. They have a lot of the, the same proteins and so forth, uh, and they cause the same type of interaction. They both bind to the ACE2 receptor. Um, so a lot of these, uh, some of some places have a head start if they've already started some of that research. And it's really too bad that they didn't continue that. Otherwise we might have something that would be more effective against um, this uh, SARS-2 or COVID-19 virus. There's also been quite a bit of uh, innovation in virus antibody uh, immunization vaccine um, technology. So the NIH has a team working on this and they've been able to in the past two months make more progress than they did uh, in the previous 20 months, the last time they tried to develop an emergency va vaccine, the speed and uh, technology have developed pretty significantly. And we have some new strategies with RNA vaccines and some different ways of doing things. And then there's always the option of um, using antistere from recovered patients as a short-term passive immunity, as it's called, where you can actually 
borrow the antibodies from somebody who's recovered. They still have the antibodies in the blood, but they've cleared the virus. And so you can actually use the antibodies for uh, this as well. And so there's some, some trials underway for this as sort of a last resort for extremely sick patients. So a globally available vaccine, even if you can develop a really good vaccine in order to ramp up production to the point where it would be readily available to the population, generally they estimate is a year. Hopefully we can get ahead of some of that. And there may be some other options that we haven't discovered yet. Uh, you know, David, some other technology sort of off the shelf that we already have. Hopefully there'll be something that, that comes to the fore that we can get to much quicker. Actually, I, I, it was interesting. I saw an article this morning that on the BBC saying that there is a company um, pushing to get that vaccine out in September, which I, I don't know how that's going to happen, but <laughs> it's going to bypass a lot of maybe the safety and toxicity testing, I'm guessing. Um, but normally you have to go through safety, toxicity testing, clinical trials, and then FDA has to come in and review and then ultimately approve these. So that's why the process takes so long, especially for a vaccine, because a vaccine you're giving to healthy individuals, right? And you don't want that vaccine, for example, to cause health, thousands of healthy people sick. You know, you're looking for efficacy, whether it's working or you're looking for uh, safety as well, or I'm um, actually both. So um, you don't want an over response of the immune system, for example, uh, when you give a vaccine, um, you know, some people are more susceptible and they might produce some kind of, they might be more sensitive to vaccines. And that's why they give you that paper when you get your flu shot saying, you know, um, <laughs> that you might have a, some kind of adverse reaction and some people do. And that's a lot of it's, it comes down to actually genetics too. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting how, <clears throat> um, how your genetics plays a role, because up to this point, most of the data we have is from the Chinese, right? The, all the, the Chinese and what, what's been happening to them um, and how they're responding to, to the virus. And, and what we found is that it seems like that the Americans and Europeans are uh, responding quite differently in some aspects. So um, the gene variants um, between one person to the next person um, can put someone more at risk than other people. Um, so it's something that we definitely have to consider. We now we have to consider the host component and where whoever gets it is the host, right? And so it's not just the pathogen. We have to look also at the host too. So, so the fact that uh, more younger people are getting affected and, and, and having more of a, seeing more serious effects, especially in Europe and the US, and then, then China, that might be a, a genetic variant issue that, that uh, needs to be resolved. I know what, one of the issues that they're all looking at is how herd immunity uh, works through this. Can you share a little bit about the biology of herd humanity or herd immunity uh, when it comes to COVID-19? Have you seen any of these videos where it has a match head igniting the next match head, igniting the next match head, and then they drop a match head out and that's social distancing yeah. and it prevents the spread to the next person? Herd immunity does the same thing. That match head is already burnt, if you will. It's gotten the virus, it's immune to the virus, so that person can't pass it on. So if you do contact, contact tracing, for instance, so if you're infectious, you have a certain percentage chance of spreading the virus to everybody you contact, right? Well, if 60% of the people you contact are immune and you only had, say, a 50% chance of passing it anyway, the virus is going to have a very difficult time spreading in the population, right? Because you have to run into people who are susceptible to the virus. And with different viruses, they have what's called an R naught. It's basically the number of people one infected person typically infects. We're still not quite clear what the R naught of COVID-19 is um, because we don't know its incidence in the population. 
So testing has run far, far, far behind cases. And so we don't know how many people have had it. We don't know exactly how transmissible it is, but if enough people in the population are immune, it basically is self-limiting. With different viruses, some have very, very low r nots. It's hard for them to infect other people. It requires close personal contact or exchange of body fluids. Other viruses, measles has one of the highest r not ever recorded. You can walk through a room if you're actively shedding measles particles, and anybody who walks through that room for the next few hours is almost certain to contract the disease if they're not immune. It's got the most, uh, it's got the highest R naught of any disease that I'm aware of. So since we don't know how transmissible it is, we don't know exactly how many people we need immune in a population to limit its spread. Um, and at this point, we just don't even have the data to make guesses. But the idea is everybody that an infected patient runs into, there needs to be a certain percentage of the population that's immune that will limit the spread from that individual, right? And so it's a balance of how many people have been infected with how infectious the viral particle is. Now, I've seen uh, statements out there that uh, COVID-19 can last for an hour, it can be spread within six feet. It can be spread within 30 feet. It can live for three days on a phone. I mean, kind of everything in between. Uh, what do you all know about how long COVID-19 can actually spread and live outside of a body? Well, I've heard some people that the virus, the, the COVID-19, it, uh, it festers for a month or you know, it's usually weeks just because of the fact that a person has to build immunity to it and it hasn't never been exposed to this type of virus. Um, this is an animal virus and we've never run into this. So our immune system, uh, it's gonna take longer to respond and it's to create those antibodies. So um, in most cases, I, I would think, and I think what we're seeing this is that it's, it's really lasting a long time in people and sometimes too long because um, our immune system isn't able to, to fight it off fast enough before the pneumonia sets in and then the death comes. And so people who have a strong immune, immune system that um, they're actually doing better because uh, you know they're producing the antibodies much quicker than those say elderly or with chronic diseases, um, their immune systems are not primed and they're not strong enough. So when, when they're infected, it just takes so much longer. And by the time their immune system is just getting started, it's, it's a little bit too late. And as far as its transmission from person to person and its survival on surfaces, there's a little bit of conflicting data out there and it sort of depends on how you do the tests. With any virus, its enemy is heat and light. So UV light is very, very good at destroying viruses. One of the reasons many upper respiratory syndromes are seasonal is because you move into summertime, long days, lots of intense sunlight, and the viruses can't survive on surfaces. So as we move into summer, you'll see a vast decrease in frequency of influenza, for instance. And so it's termed a seasonal infection. It's really not, it's just moved on to colder climates. Um, and it rotates around the globe. Influenza never stops. And so we may see something similar here with uh, the COVID-19. But as far as on surfaces, a lot of studies are showing it's going to depend on the surface. It's going to depend on the amount of light it receives, the amount of UV irradiation especially, and temperature as well. So for many surfaces, they're saying hours to days. Originally, there was a lot of panic on, okay, anything that was shipped from China is possibly coated with COVID-19. There's absolutely no evidence that it would survive on any surface that long. Uh, the bigger concern is movement from person to person, like Damon was saying. So. Surface transmission is a real thing. Wash your hands, stop touching your face, uh, cover your cough, that sort of thing. And as far as the distance, 
most studies are showing that it absolutely can be transmitted by droplets, but that it's not an aerosol, probably. Uh, and the difference is an aerosol can hang in the air for a long period of time, like the measles I mentioned, whereas a droplet is heavy enough that it actually falls to the surface, and then you actually have to surface to transmit it. Uh, the six foot distance is sort of a standard distance for droplet protections. If you sneeze, those droplets leave your body at a much higher velocity and will cover more than six feet. So it's just sort of a compromise number for social distancing. Does that answer your question between yep. the two? Absolutely. I and do have one. Can, can I add something to that? Actually? Absolutely. Um, so the, for example, the influenza virus, when we're talking about seasonality, um, it's, uh, it survives better in colder, drier climates. And uh, with the warmer weather coming, especially in our hemisphere, um, the, uh, the expelled droplets that come out that transmit the, the virus um, will absorb better in a more humid environment. And as things get more humid, those, these droplets will drop faster to the ground. So the distance between two people um, may shorten a little bit, which may make it less contagious slightly. Um, so, so viruses are in general, like uh, Dr. Parker said, they're less stable and warmer in humid environments. Um, so they spread less effectively. So we may see something going on um, in the summer where this will drop a little bit, hopefully. Uh, a virus is exposed to strong UV um, that helps deteriorate these uh, uh, viruses. So, um, however, SARS-1 and MERS uh, did not really display much of a seasonal pattern. So um, we have to keep that in mind as well. So we may not see that influence as we do see in, in the flu. David, right. do you think the difference with SARS and MERS were because they were so much less transmissible, had so much, uh, especially MERS had a really low yeah. R0. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, MERS definitely as, uh, was much, more, much less transmissible, definitely. SARS-1 is more closely related to um, the COVID-19. So uh, we can kind of look at that a little bit more, but, um, but yeah, we just really don't know. We'll just have to see what happens this summer, you know. Agreed. I do have one, one more question and I want to get into actually how the body responds to this, because I think that's changed how medical professionals are engaging in this uh, pandemic. But uh, one quick question, uh, if COVID-19 genome is RNA, isn't it more susceptible to mutation? Hence, development of vaccines seems to be far into the future. So this thing could change and continue to devolve or evolve. Uh, any statements on that? Yeah, typically RNA viruses are more apt for, to change just because of the fact that they have to go through an extra step. Um, however, genomic analysis suggests that this particular type of coronavirus is mutating slowly or most more slowly from what I've read, which um, could reduce the chance that it's, it's less deadly. And in terms of a vaccine, that means that if we do develop a vaccine, um, we won't need to develop one every year like we do the flu vaccine. So it may be every two, three, four years, we don't know, depending on the mutation rate. Um, so it looks like what I've read that the coronavirus seems to be picking up about two mutations a month, which th the flu virus changes about two or three times faster than that. So I, I think once we have a, 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 a vaccine, I think that'll really um, hold for a while, which is good, which is good news for us. <clears throat> The other thing, um, I, and I agree, everything I've read says it's fairly slow, slow mutating, which is a good sign. The other thing to keep in mind is it's not just the sequence that determines the change in the protein. So even if you change the sequence of the coding gene, an antibody recognizes the three-dimensional shape of the protein, if you will. And so it may be possible for a mutation that doesn't change the function of the spike protein, which would be you know, the major target of vaccine development. If it doesn't change the shape of it, well, you can't change the shape of it too much because then it won't interact with ACE2 and the particle will no longer be infectious. 
So those changes have to be balanced with maintaining function. And so if you maintain function, you're also going to maintain what they call antigenicity. So the ability of those antibodies you generate to recognize that spike protein. So the mutation rate actually will be faster than the decline in the efficacy of the vaccine, if that makes sense as well. So many of those mutations are not going to affect the efficacy of the vaccine, rather they're going to uh, be either silent or they're going to be mutations that don't change that recognition as well. So there's some hope there also. Yeah, people think mutations, more mutations means more infectious too, which isn't necessarily true. Um, it could become, you know, if there's mutations in the S protein, which codes for that spike protein, um, it could become less dangerous and be able to kind of uh, not as well bind to that receptor. So that we could see the virus peter out if, if that happens. So um, that, that's just something that people just don't, don't realize sometimes. The other thing is uh, there's, there's what's called a good pathogen. So a good pathogen is the one that doesn't kill its host because it has to have that host to survive. So if you need people to survive, the last thing you wanna do is wipe them all out. It's okay to make them sick, but you don't wanna kill them off because then you don't have any place to live and reproduce anymore. So it may be that over time, this virus actually becomes a little less severe or the consequences of, of infection become less severe. That there appears to be some historical evidences, evidence for viruses doing that. So that's a possibility as well. That's very helpful, thank you. Uh, so let's talk about what this virus does and how the body reacts to it. So uh, people that are dying uh, are often dying of, of heart problems associated with their body trying to fight this. Uh, their lungs are filling up with uh, liquid, they're suffering from pneumonia. Uh, can we talk a little bit about how the body responds to trying to fight this and why that's uh, killing so many people? So the quick answer, and I'm sure we can expand on this significantly, is the virus doesn't kill you, your body kills you. It's your immune response and the consequences of the steps it takes to clear the virus that are causing much of the damage. Um, so when you have an infection, you begin to release signals called cytokines that tell your body, hey, I have an infection and there's steps we need to take. And depending on how long it takes for you to mount that response, as Damon mentioned, and um, how global that response is, it can be very, very different in individuals. So if you mount a good response in the nasal cavity, for instance, and keep it from dropping into the lungs, you're going to have a very different course of disease than if you have a very slow immune response and the virus reproduces and reproduces and gets in the lungs. And then the immune response has to happen in the lungs because one of the big consequences of the immune response is you release these signals called cytokines and they cause things like increased fluid in the lungs and um, efficiency in the lungs. And so you're depleting lung efficiency, you're, uh, and, and then it becomes this sort of vicious cycle of more damage, more cytokines, more damage, more cytokines, more damage, more cytokines. And in some individuals, you'll develop what's called a cytokine storm, where the cytokine levels get so high and uh, are released at such high levels throughout the body that they can cause multi-organ system, multi system failures. Um, and I don't know how specific or how deep we want to go to, down that uh, pathway, uh, but it, much of it has to do with the way your body responds to the virus that, rather than what your virus does to the cells. Damon, do you want to elaborate? Well, I'll... I won't get too technical, but um, if you go to more of a molecular level, we look at the people who are more susceptible. We have uh, people who have chronic disease, people who are elderly, and also uh, men compared to women seem to have more of an impact. And uh, they think this is due to decreased ACE2 levels in these people. Um, and 
you might ask, well, what does gender have to do with it? Well, the ACE2 gene is actually on the X chromosome. So since females have two X chromosomes and males only have one copy of the X chromosome, uh, females have more of that ACE gene. So they're, they have more ACE activity, which means they have more protection. And so, so, so that's the reason why um, a little bit, if, if we're kind of honing in on some of these uh, populations at risk that could be playing a factor in, in the mortality rates being higher in these populations. Share a little bit about how uh, the medical community is responding to this. So we're seeing, you know, a clearing out of elective surgeries, uh, a really kind of focus in on treating this disease. Um, we've got uh, ventilators that are helping people uh, there's also statements out there about taking vitamin D and zinc and how to prepare your body for all this. Can you give us a sense of how the medical community is responding to fight this virus? Uh, and then, uh, well, I'll get to my next question after that, but uh, give us a sense of uh, how they're dealing with this, uh, how they're bring, preventing the bodies from overreacting in some cases uh, to this virus so that the that the person doesn't die. Damon, do you oh, have you any insights? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Damon, do you have insights you want to share? <laughs> well, I, I, I've heard some things about zinc and vitamin D and so forth, um, which is, it's kind of just kind of still up in the air, but zinc is, uh, what, what it does is it inhibits viral replication. So it's, it's, it's kind of antiviral properties. Uh, the only problem is zinc cannot get into the cell. So it needs what they call an ionophore to get it into the cell. Um, there's a, a drug, chloroquine, that's been in the news that might be able to help the zinc enter the cell. Um, but we, we, don't, we don't know that. I know vitamin D, uh, which is made for, from UV sun exposure, UVB to be exact. Um, so a lot of people, there's been studies have shown that's a lot of vitamin D insufficiency and deficiency that's common, especially in elderly, obese, and uh, people in northern latitudes, they're not getting enough sun, right? And, and also um, dark-skinned people as well. So, so vitamin D supplementation might help increase or decrease the risk from SARS infection and, and you know, vitamin D in general uh, helps boost their immune system. So, and that could also play a role in um, it being seasonal where people might have a, a little bit more of a stronger immune response um, than uh, in, in, the, in the summer than in the winter time, for example. Um, there's some anecdotal evidence about vitamin C in very high doses. Um, there was something in, in China saying that people recovered three to five days quicker, but there's, you know, it's not a properly uh, constructed <laughs> um, experiment. So uh, we just kind of have to take it as kind of anecdotal things. Um, <clears throat> but the other questions about how the medical field, uh, that might be better answered by someone who's a nurse or a physician. I'm not sure if, if I know I'm not qualified to to kind of deal with that, that answer. Yeah, my wife was actually working in the ED when the whole thing broke out, um, but she has not been uh, working for the last few weeks because she had a significant exposure in her ED rotations and uh, became fairly ill, brought it home and shared it with me and the kids. So none of us have actually been tested because we were told stay home, stay away from everybody. But we've had a very, very interesting infection in our household over the last few weeks, nothing like I've ever had before. Fortunately, you know, Lord be praised, we're doing fine, but uh, pretty substantial lower respiratory uh, symptoms, fever, aches, fatigue, all the, we checked all the boxes. So, uh, she was in the front lines when nobody knew what the heck to do and every hospital she worked at was doing something different. 
but has not been back since. So I don't have any insights either. She's going to return to work this week. She's been asymptomatic long enough that her uh, uh, hospital is, is having her back tomorrow. So wow. yeah, unfortunately that would, we have other CCU friends that would probably be better equipped to answer some of those questions, Jeff. Well, Dr. Parker, I'm glad you're feeling better. Uh, praise yeah. God for that. Um, let's talk a little bit. Uh, we've only got about really about seven minutes left. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. In fact, we've gotten so many questions on this one and uh, a lot from uh, people who follow biology because they're talking very complicated RNA and different <laughs> parts of the, of the breakdown of the virus, which I, I really appreciate. I love it. But let's talk about uh, helping people understand where we go from here. Uh, is there hope in the defeat, uh, or at least of the uh, uh, of the restricting of COVID nineteen? Will we get through this? Uh, can we start to open up eventually? Uh, these our, our communities um, address kind of the roadmap that we should go down at least in addressing uh, COVID-19 and uh, getting our society back to normal, whatever that means. <laughs> I think we can learn from um, what South Korea is doing. They, they're doing mass uh, testing, okay? And they're really doing contact tracing, which means anybody who tests positive, they're, they're going back and, and they're more concerned about public health and not, uh, personal privacy. So they are all into looking at who have you been in contact with, where have you been? Um, and I think because their numbers of infections were skyrocketing with a lot of other countries and it, it really diminished um, once they've got a handle on who has the virus and when, what they can, they can contain those people, isolate them so they can't um, spread it to other people. So I think and they've learned from going through the MERS um, um, outbreak there, which was which was pretty pretty harsh in South Korea. So I, I think uh, we can learn from them. Uh, and I think we're a little bit behind in, in the testing because that that could really help us kind of identify who has it, uh, who they've been in contact with, and then just kind of uh, helping uh, just gain some knowledge and 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 how to deal with it, how to quarantine it, and how to put it off to the put those people off to the side, and then, uh, but you know, we're the tests are few and far between these days, and and how how who how you qualified even get tested is is controversial. So <laughs> that I think that that would really help us out if we could get a lot of tests out there and get people tested. I, I agree completely. That's that's the limiting factor right now. Um, we're hampered by ignorance. Until we can up the testing and, and reach the levels that they're doing in some other countries, we're we're flying blind. And I think we need to look very carefully at countries that are just ahead of us. So, for instance, Italy got really really bad and is now sort of starting to come out of it. And so I think if we can see how Sorry, my dog is going nuts at the other room. Um, if we can uh, see how they're uh, sort of opening back up and how that goes, that sort of thing. Moving forward, the essential key is going to be testing not just people who have the disease, but people who had it and recovered. Because if we can get a handle on the number of immune people in the population, it's going to give us much better picture of how to handle things like the fall. Do children return to uh, public education? Do colleges reopen the dorms? If you have a better handle on the number of immune uh, individuals in the population and a better handle on the r not as a result of that, you'll, you'll have a much more informed decision-making stance than we are right now. So I think for us moving forward, the key is going to be caution, but uh, combined with some optimism because other countries, you know, like uh, Dr. Perez mentioned South Korea, if we can see what 
is working well for other people and avoid mistakes that some have made. If you look historically, different cities handled the reopening differently in 1919 after the, the global Spanish flu pandemic. And I think the classic two cities were St. Louis and Philadelphia, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, St. Louis was very strict with their stay at home orders and the disease didn't have too bad of a course in St. Louis. And Philadelphia decided to take almost no measures and it was devastating and wiped out a large percentage of their population. And so I think we need to sort of know history to not be doomed to repeat it. And if we can learn from the successes and failures of others, that will be a good guideline for us. I wish yeah. I had an answer. I wish I could say May 15th, we're good, let's go. But unfortunately, <laughs> uh, nobody has that right now. Well, I think uh, if I could sum up here as we kind of close, um, you all have provided a really good analysis, a biological analysis of, of uh, COVID-19. Uh, this isn't a total mystery. Uh, we have faced similar challenges in the past, but uh, it's unique. It's different. It's not the same as SARS-1, uh, and uh, it's not quite as aggressive uh, contagiously as the measles are, but, uh, but we, we do face challenges, um, and we've got to work through them. One of the biggest is that uh, we've got to develop a vaccine. That takes time because you don't want to develop a vaccine that harms other people. Uh, if we, especially if we roll it out into masses amounts of people. So it's got to be done right. Uh, and there are safeguards there, but there, we are, it looks like in many ways, getting rid of some of the red tape that may have slowed that down. We could get it as aggressively as we possibly can, but we've got to make sure that it remains safe. Uh, we still have a lot to learn. Uh, we've got to learn primarily from people that have survived this, uh, why they survived it, how their bodies react. So we've got to test them, we've got to get broader testing out. But uh, I do, as you mentioned, we're cautious, but we're optimistic. Uh, I think we'll come through this, but we've got to treat it seriously. Uh, it, it, Dr. Parker, if it's something that you went through and just the way you described it, uh, it sounds horrible and, uh, and it's, it is killing people in our community. So we've got to treat it very, very seriously. But uh, we have the tools to understand this. We've got to move through that process, but we will come out on the other side. Anything that I missed there that you all would like to say in your closing words? I think that's an excellent summary, thank you. Um, one thing that I don't know if, if our viewers are aware of, but a lot of these efforts are at least being guided by the National Institutes of Health. And if you're not familiar with the director of the National Institutes of Health, his name is Francis Collins. He's an extraordinarily gifted scientist, but he also happens to be a devout evangelical Christian. And so it gives me some comfort in knowing that he's at the helm of that organization at a time like this as well. So hopefully some of our viewers can be praying for him, Francis Collins, and his efforts as well. That's great. Dr. Perez, any closing words for you? Well, I think all the social distancing and all that we can't go to movies, can't go shopping, whatever, I think it's just an opportunity to reconnect with God for many of us, especially those who are not on the front lines, um, an opportunity to appreciate, I think, life because this life is so fragile. It's uh, you're seeing so many people die. I, there's a faculty that teaches for me in, in New Jersey, New York, and there he's just, uh, you know, it's really bad out there. And, um, and we just got to give thanks and prayers to those on the front lines and nurses, the, the medical people all involved there. Uh, I'm your wife, Dr. Parker. It's just, it's just amazing what they're doing and the risk that they're taking um, to actually help people. And I think, and, and that's what Jesus calls us to do is be compassionate and help people. And, and, and they're, they're doing a great job. So we, we need to pray for them. Amen. I've been uh, very inspired by hearing stories of our, our nurses on the front lines. And uh, we just all had a faculty meeting where we heard from students, graduates of CCU that are on the front lines in Italy serving. And so this is a moment where you do get to see the, the expansion of the church and the work of the church throughout the world uh, serving one another. Um, I want to thank Dr. Perez, Dr. Parker. You have done a wonderful job. Thank you for helping us understand the biology 
of COVID-19. This was very helpful. Thank you for the expertise that you bring to Colorado Christian University. And most importantly, our students and how you're passing that on to the next generation. We're so very grateful for you. As we close here, I just want to say if this is a time where you are looking for that opportunity to take your career to the next level, Colorado Christian University's College of Adult and Graduate Studies is a wonderful opportunity for you. Uh, we have over 80 degree programs, many of them entirely online. Uh, over 88% of our students receive financial aid. The average class size, only 11 students. The total student body is over 7,000 in the College of Adult and Graduate Studies another 1,400 uh, on our campus. So uh, you can become a part of a great community with Colorado Christian University. And I urge you, go to ccu.edu if this is the time for you to look uh, into that next chapter of your life and expanding your degree. ccu.edu is where you can get all the information there. Thank you again for being a part of this. Our next webinar is on Monday, 5 p.m. We're gonna host uh, pundit, author, thinker, Michael Barone, uh, from the American Enterprise Institute, 5 p.m. back here at our YouTube channel, and you can watch it then. Until then, thank you so much. God bless you all. Take care.